Hello and welcome back to Fourier Transform, the video series where we talk a lot about so-called Fourier series. And in today's part 18, we will talk about a very important function called the Dirichlet kernel. This one can be seen as a core element in the definition of the Fourier series and it will also help us for the proof of the pointwise convergence. However, as always, before we start, I first want to thank all the nice people who support this channel on Steady, here on YouTube or via other means. And please don't forget, you can download all the additional material for the video with the link in the description. And now without further ado, let's immediately state the definition of the Dirichlet kernel. It's a continuous function on R and denoted by dn. Indeed, it just maps the real numbers to the real numbers again and it's defined for every natural number n. And moreover, we have already seen this function in previous videos. Namely, it's just given by a finite sum consisting of exponential functions. These are complex exponential functions where we go through all k starting with minus n and ending with n. And since we add them up in a symmetric way, the result is a real number again. And now this whole collection of functions is what we call the Dirichlet kernel. So you see this is quite a simple definition and you might remember that we have already calculated with that in part 11. There we have seen that we can write this whole sum also with cosine functions. Namely it's the constant 1 plus 2 times a sum of cosine functions. And with that representation you immediately see that the outcome is a real number again. And in addition to that we can also reformulate it to get an expression without any sum in it. In fact this one is also explained in part 11. And there what we get is a sine function in the numerator containing an n and a sine function in the denominator. However this one is quite simple because it's just sine of 1 half x so there is no n involved. The only problem we see there is that we could have zeros in the denominator. Indeed all numbers of the form 2 pi m are zeros of this sine function. Hence for this representation we have a discrete set of exception points but these are not a problem at all because we already know that we have a continuous function anyway. In other words we can just uniquely extend the function on the right hand side here at the exception points as well. Therefore this is clearly the best representation of our Dirichlet kernel because we can immediately plot this function. So let's use our Python script as always to plot it from minus pi to plus pi. So here we have chosen n as 11 and please don't forget that the whole function is 2 pi periodic. And now if you want you can just play with it and then you see when you increase n you increase the number of oscillations and also the height of the peak in the middle. This behavior is quite obvious if you look at the first or the second representation because there you see at the origin we will just add up once. So in particular if we send n to infinity we don't have pointwise convergence of this sequence of functions at all. But still the whole Dirichlet kernel is very helpful for representing Fourier series. In fact it gives us a very short formula to remember the whole Fourier series. This means for a fixed function f and a fixed natural number n we can look at f and f f at a given point x in the real number line. Indeed if we stop the Fourier series at a natural number n we know we get out a continuous function. And you know that this one can be written as a sum over exponential functions with Fourier coefficients ck. Moreover these coefficients can be calculated by an integration. More precisely we have the factor 1 over 2 pi in front and then we integrate from minus pi to pi. And then inside we have the exponential function with a minus sign times f of x. However since x is already used we should use a new variable y inside the integration. And there we have it this whole thing is just ck in our sum. Which means we still have to multiply with our exponential function at the end. And now since we have a finite sum we can just pull it into the integration. So first we have our integral then f of y and then the whole sum of the exponential functions. However there we can easily put them together by writing i k times x minus y in the exponent. So the sum is just over the exponential functions and there we recognize our definition of the Dirichlet kernel. In fact it's just dn 
at the position x minus y. And this is quite a nice result because it tells us that the whole Fourier series of f is just given as this integral over the Dirichlet kernel for every natural number n. And there I can tell you this explains the name kernel because it means it's inside a whole integration operation. Moreover, we can also shift the variables from dn to f by substituting x minus y. So let's quickly do that. Let's call x minus y z. And then you can quickly check that the boundaries will shift to x minus pi and x plus pi. However, since we are 2 pi periodic in f and dn, this shift does not do anything anyway. However, then instead of y, we have x minus z inside of f. And on the other side, we just have dn of z. So this was the whole substitution, and as already mentioned, we can also go back to the integral from minus pi to pi. And there you eventually see that we just have flipped the variable names between the two functions. And indeed, if we want, we can also change the order and write d and z times f of x minus z. And there we see that we can also equivalently write the whole thing as an inner product. So it's our L2 inner product with dn in the first component and the shifted function f in the second component. And this one we can write as f of x minus dot because only the variable x is fixed. This formulation is already very helpful, but on the other hand, we could also write it as a convolution if you know what that means. Indeed, the convolution is not complicated at all, it's just this integral altogether. And then one would simply write dn star f. And as the left hand side, the Fourier series, it has to be evaluated at the point x. So you see, we have two nice formulations for the Fourier series, which uses the Dirichlet kernel. Both things are quite helpful if we want to write down proofs concerning the Fourier series of f. But before we do these applications, let's first look at some nice properties of our Dirichlet kernel. And the first thing we could do is to count the zeros the Dirichlet kernel has as a continuous function. And obviously the zeros are exactly given by the numerator in the sine representation. So we just have to know how many zeros the sine function has in the interval from minus pi to plus pi. Indeed, there we find that we have exactly 2n plus 1 zeros. However, we also have one exception here. Simply because the zero at the origin for the numerator is also a zero for the denominator. And obviously the picture already tells us that for our continuous extension, we don't have a zero at the origin. Therefore, our result here is that we have exactly two n zeros in our given interval from minus pi to plus pi. Moreover, for n is equal to 5, we also see it in this picture. Now maybe the second property is even more interesting because we can also calculate the integral for each dn. If you look at the plot above, you see we have to add up a lot of negative areas and a lot of positive areas as well. So it's not so clear what comes out here, but actually it's quite easy to calculate. Simply because the Dirichlet kernel dn is just given as a sum of exponential functions. So first we have the constant 1 plus e to the power ix plus e to the power minus ix. And then we just continue with higher exponents, but nothing else changes. And I write it like that because then you can actually see that we just have to integrate two pi periodic functions. Hence, every integral here is definitely just zero, with the exception of the constant in the front. And this one just gives us the factor 2 pi. And this has a nice consequence, because 2 pi is exactly the factor we have in front of our inner product. This means if we have dn applied to the constant function 1 in our L2 inner product, then we always get out 1, no matter what n is. So you could say, in that sense, our dn is normalized. Okay, and now for the third property, I want to look at the integral of dn again, but now with the absolute value inside. And obviously this changes a lot, because now we only add up positive areas. And now we can show that this total area definitely depends on n. In fact, it will increase with n, and it will go to infinity. So we can say that the sequence of these integrals is not bounded. Showing that is not too complicated, but we have to do a little bit of work. 
But of course, the idea is quite clear because we just want to estimate our function d and x in the absolute value. This means with the sign representation, we have an absolute value in the numerator and the denominator. And there, the numerator is quite a simple function because it does not depend on n. Moreover, if we only look at the positive x-axis, we don't need the absolute value at all because the sign is positive there as well. In fact, the sine function from 0 to pi half looks quite simple. So it's quite simple, this is the graph of sine of 1 half x. And obviously because of our symmetry of the Dirichlet kernel, we just have to consider the right hand side the right x-axis anyway. So we can completely ignore the negative x-axis in our calculation. And now since the sine function has a positive derivative in zero, we can just choose a bigger slope to estimate the whole sine function. So for example, the function x is definitely always bigger than sine of one half x. This is all we need because if we divide by a bigger number, we have an estimate for our dnx. So clearly we get smaller or stay equal if we divide by x instead of the sine function. And this holds no matter which positive x we choose. And this is enough because we can split up our integral into two parts. Namely, it's two times the integral from zero to pi. And there we can use our estimate and everything looks much simpler. So now we only have one sine function in the integration and we can make it even simpler by substituting this one. So let's call it y and let's do the substitution for the whole integral. So first the boundaries will change to zero and n plus one half times pi. Moreover, in the numerator we just have sine of y and in the denominator we just have y because the factor cancels with the factor of the differential. So the whole integral is much nicer, but maybe you don't like this one half on the boundary. And to get rid of that, we can just make the whole thing smaller by just integrating to n times pi. And with that we are almost done, because to solve this integral here, we can just integrate from zero to zero. To formulate it more precisely, the sine function has a lot of zeros and we can integrate from one zero to another. And afterwards we can just sum all the areas up. This means the whole integral can be written as a sum of integrals. And there we can start at k is equal to one and go to n. And then the lower bound of the integral is k minus one times pi and the upper bound is k times pi. So this is the whole thing and now we can estimate the function inside the integral. Again, we can say a lot about the denominator because it's just the function y. And in our given interval, this one is at maximum k times pi. This means we get smaller or stay equal if we divide by the maximum. So with that trick, y vanishes completely from the denominator. So we can also pull it out and then we just have an integral of the sine function. And since sine is 2 pi periodic, it does not matter what k is, we always get out the same integral and you might know this is equal to 1. This means what we get here is a constant factor times a sum over 1 over k. And there we know this is exactly the harmonic sum which is divergent. So if we send n to infinity, the right hand side goes to infinity and therefore also the left hand side. And that's it, this finishes the proof. So we see in the limit n to infinity, the Dirichlet kernel is not simple at all. And this also explains why the whole Fourier series theory is not so simple. And now as promised, we can use the properties of the Dirichlet kernel to show the pointwise convergence of the Fourier series as stated in the last video. However, this will also need some work, so let's do that in the next video. So I really hope I meet you there and have a nice day. Bye bye.